So this is specifically a case study for R.D. Bailey Dam um, flood hazard estimation that I, I calculated as part of the risk cadre work and I presented at a conference as well. So our learning objectives on this one is to present a flood hazard case study. We're gonna discuss the flood hazard inputs, assumptions, analyses, and results. And we're gonna demonstrate how incorporating available information can reduce flood hazard uncertainty and change the project risk estimates. So just an overview of what we're gonna talk about. Um, so for R.D. Bailey, the flood hazard estimates were completed using varying amounts and quality of data and information. Um, the initial risk estimates using flood frequency analysis were based on a limited period of record, and those results were considered unacceptable um, specifically for potential of dam failure during overtopping of the embankment. So that elevated the project to a higher level of study, so it had too high of overtopping risk based on the initial assessment. Um, we'll go over some of the project background. We'll discuss the PMF update. We'll discuss the rating curves and operations, the volume frequency analysis inputs, and the Bayesian analysis. And we'll look at how adding precipitation frequency information um, changed the risk and the loading curve, and finally move from flow frequency to stage frequency. All right, just some background here. R.D. Bailey Dam is on the Guyandot River Basin, upstream of Huntington, West Virginia. It has a drainage area of about 540 square miles. Um, it's a rock fill embankment with reinforced concrete on the upstream face. It also has a uncontrolled broad crested partially lined spillway to the north there. So we have the embankment, the reservoir, and the spillway off to the right. Stilling basin and the retreat channel down here. All right, so here's just a table of pertinent information, um, kind of standard for our loading curve reports. Um, some things to note, it was com the construction was completed in 1980. It has that 540 square mile drainage area. The spillway crest elevation is at 1155 feet, which is the equal to the top of the flood pool. Um, the minimum dam crest elevation is about two feet lower than the original design crest of 1200 feet. You can see the original design freeboard, they had five feet of freeboard. So whatever spillway design flood they used prior to construction, they built it five feet higher than that. So the PMF update was completed ahead of the IES study. Um, and what we would, the PMF was completed at a base level effort or a screening level effort. Um, and that resulted in a little over a seven feet of overtopping of the embankment crest for a, a, a duration of about 10 hours. So in the end, this risk assessment only had one risk driver that was overtopping of the embankment during a large flood like a PMF. So because of the combination of the frequency and consequences, the risk was above our tolerable guidelines, so this warranted further study and went on to an IES study. So because we're dealing with an overtopping failure mode here, we needed to extend the different rating curves to account for those higher pools beyond original design. And we wanted to do this using better tools than were used in the PMF study. So we did some digging and found equations and coefficients from the original spillway design, and we used those to match and extend the spillway rating curve. Um, by we, I think it might have been Ryan in this case. So according to the water control manual, the maximum... <laughs> That's good work, man. So according to the water control manual for this project, um, the max flood control release is 5,000 CFS. The sluice gates assumed max release of 10,000 were based on coordination with the district. So again, you know, the water control manual might say something, in practice they might do something else. It's always worth coordinating with the the project operators to best understand how your project's going to operate. Um, we used a CREST survey and an HEC RAS 1D steady flow model to do a better job of quantifying what the overtopping discharge would be on the dam crest. So I know a lot of times we simplify it to a single elevation with a weir calculation. A little more work if we have a survey as we can plot the actual crest elevations and do a weir calculation like that in a program like RAS. All right, so let's talk about the volume frequency inflow data we used. There is readily available USGS gauge data prior to the dam construction, both upstream and downstream of the current dam site. Um, available daily and peak flows were used to estimate peak annual two-day volumes at the dam site for years 1929 to 1968. That added 40 years of additional systematic data. Um, yeah, and notice that we mentioned a data gap 
from 1969 to 1979, so about 10 years before the dam was built. And also notice that the historical data at the Logan gauge was used to extend the period of record even longer and do some additional sensitivities. But this gauge data ultimately was not used in the period of record because the gauge was farther downstream and we couldn't corroborate it with uh, any other gauge data. So this was the final period of record used in our analysis. As you can see, again, we have that data gap from 1969 to 1979, and we used a perception threshold to fill that. And we, we limited it based on some of the largest observed flows that we had in our record. Um, again, if something greater than that threshold happened, it's likely it would have been recorded. So this period of record prior to any regional information added has an equivalent record of about 80 to 85 years total. Okay. All right, so let's talk about critical inflow duration. Um, the largest events in the historical records that were available were, were pulled together to determine that critical inflow duration. You should always try to find larger events as we are more interested in the upper tail of our frequency curve, which will be driven by large events. So for R.D. Bailey, the critical inflow duration was determined to be two days, as most of the events were basically two day events from the start of the event to the peak elevation. You can see those loosely labeled here. We had a couple of two days. We had one that might have been two to three days. All right, so with a little bit of research, a regional skew for the watershed was found. Um, the peak regional skew was negative 0.2 with a mean square error of 0.217. Um, because R.D. Bailey has a two-day critical inflow, it was decided that the peak regional skew was still appropriate to apply to our two-day duration volume frequency analysis. So we talked yesterday about regional skew and how there's lots of different methods to do it. In this study for the state of West Virginia, they decided the best representation of regional skew is based on the physical location within the state. So they basically have ISO heights that change what regional skew you use based on where you are. So we were right down here in this little bullseye where it was negative 0.2. All right, let's talk a little bit again about how the regional skew works in our Bayes analysis. We have the regional skew that I just mentioned of negative 0.2 with an MSE of 0.217. We take that information and enter it into best fit with an, with an assumed normal distribution, right? So the mean and the MSE um, inform this normal distribution in, by inputting a mean and a standard deviation. So again, we entered a standard deviation of 0.466 that was based on that MSE. The at site skew for the extended period of record was 0 0.08. So now let's look at the density plot of the skew when the regional skew is applied. Oops, that was supposed to be an animation here. So you can see that the blue density curve is a normal distribution that represents the same regional skew. And you can see that the blue line right at, is right at negative 0.2 because that was the mean of that distribution. And now we can see that the red density plot is our posterior density that combined the station and the regional skew. And we can see the median of that is now at about negative 0.05. If the regional skew had a lower standard deviation, it might have pulled the posterior closer to it. So the red, the median for the red distribution might have got closer to the blue, but it had a relatively large standard devi deviation. So the posterior skew ended up moving only slightly from the station skew. So you can see the station skew, the regional skew, and the posterior or final skew there. That just means there was more certainty in the systematic data derived skew than the regional skew. All right, so here we have plotted a quick comparison of volume frequency curves. As you can see, the curves for the different durations run about parallel to each other. And I say we didn't do any statistical curve smoothing. That's not something we do very often in current analyses, but if anybody's been doing this for a few years, you know that we'll look at, we'll look at different um, durations. And if they cross each other, that's not physically possible. So we might adjust the statistics a little bit. But here, looking at peak through five day, they didn't cross. They're running parallel. We didn't need to do anything like that. All right, I wanted to stop here before moving on just so you can have an idea for the change effects of adding data for, for this project. So this is the flow frequency curve that was originally used that included only inflow records after the dam was built. So just 1980 and after. So at that screen level effort, this left the overtopping failure as the risk driver. So look how much uncertainty we have. Um, look at how far our expected curve is from our posterior mode curve, right? 
So short period of record means a lot of uncertainty, results in the, the average or the mean loading being pretty frequent. This is how the flow frequency curve changed with the addition of just readily available USGS gauge record prior to dam construction. So this shows you right away how important it is to do just a little bit of digging for historical records. So this flow frequency reflects that period of record that we looked at a few slides ago that went all the way back to 1929. Um, the red curve here is our two-day PMF volume, which was driving our overtopping risk. Notice that it shifted one and a half orders of magnitude to the right from when we were just using 1980 to current um, inflow records. This flow frequency curve now reflects the addition of the regional skew. So even though the regional skew had a large standard deviation, so we had less knowledge or certainty, it still tightened our credible intervals or our uncertainty to shift the estimate of the PMF volume by almost an order of magnitude to the right. So you can see that the credible intervals tightened about an order of magnitude overall as well. So now if we look back, we have seen the PMF volume move about two orders of magnitude total just by adding readily available information. All right, so now let's look at the precipitation frequency analysis. This was one of the first projects that we applied um, precipitation frequency in the Bayes analysis. Um, for R.D. Bailey, it was determined that the critical precipitation duration was one day, so that's different than our inflow volume, um, our critical inflow volume duration of two days. Um, the aerial reduction factor this, for this basin size and the critical precipitation duration came to be about somewhere between 0.79 to 0.82, right? So we had a little bit of uncertainty about that. And But however, we went back and looked at some HMR 51 index storms, and the index storm number one was really close to our site, and it had a 24-hour aerial reduction factor of 0.94 based on those depth area duration curves and tables. So we decided to go with the higher end of the range of 0.82. So I'd like to put this in here because we do have standard processes, right? We do have spreadsheets that step you through. We have curves, we tell you what to do, but it's okay to do a little bit of engineering judgment if you have reasons to stray from the standard a little bit. So um, after we pulled all of our NOAA Atlas 14 precipitation data for um, all three curves, so that's the upper, the lower, and the computed curve, we extrapolated them using a GEV fit with a uh, spreadsheet tool we had at the time. All right, so we used our spreadsheet tools to walk through the process to scale the hydrographs and prep the data to route through HEC HMS, so what Alan talked about in his precipitation frequency presentation. Um, per our standard guidance, the depths were scaled and routed for three AEPs, again, standard 10-year, uh, 100-year, and 1,000-year AEPs. And we used our HEC HMS model that was calibrated and validated, and it was set up with three different basin models reflect, reflecting a range in loss rate parameters, as well as using three different observed event hiato graphs to sample the variability of rainfall patterns that we have observed over our basin. So the routing results from our computed NOAA Atlas 14 curve with our best estimate losses from each of our three observed storm event shapes are plotted here as orange squares. And along with that, the maximum and minimum router results are plotted as blue squares, just to show you the total range. And those are plotted on our two-day Bayesian flow frequency results that just considered our pre and post dam systematic data and incorporated the regional skew. So we haven't incorporated any precipitation frequency information yet. Um, the modeled runoff results using regional precipitation frequency were then directly incorporated into our Bayesian analysis by estimating the prior distributions of discharge for each of those specific AEPs or quantiles. Um, the distribution of discharge was estimated, again, for the 1E-1, 1E-2, and 1E-3 AEPs. So just make sure everybody's following. For these three AEPs, we estimated a mean standard deviation that represented the range of rainfall runoff results we got incorporating the precipitation frequency. All right, so the quantile priors representing the rainfall runoff results are shown by the red squares with air bars here. And those air bars are for the fifth and 95th percentiles for our quantile distributions. Uh, the result of adding this information shows that the posterior predictive curve estimates or mean curve at the two-day PMF flow volume is now less frequent than 1E to the minus 7. So it's, it intersects the red PMF two-day volume off the chart over here. 
That's now more than a three order of magnitude shift less frequent from our from our, the original analysis that just used post dam inflow period of record. There's a significantly reduced uncertainty as well. So this shows that the combination of temporal, spatial, and causal rainfall runoff information expansion significantly improved our best estimate for the overtopping frequency and really reduced our uncertainty in that estimate. Um, the reduced uncertainty results in the posterior mode and the posterior predictive curve plotting much closer together as well. And note that the mean standard deviation in skew hasn't changed that much from when we just extended the period of record a little bit, but the uncertainty was greatly reduced by adding the regional information. So that was regional skew and the regional precipitation frequency information. All right, so now that the Bayesian estimation analysis is done, we need to do the thing where we take that result and get it into RMC RFA. So we have a spreadsheet tool where that we, we put our um, best fit results in, we put the statistics for a posterior mode, and we can calculate an effective record length. Or, and then we, can, we also have a, a spreadsheet to verify and guess and check. So for this project, to get the uncertainty and the expected curve to match the best we could to best fit, that was about um, 150 years. And remember, our input data was about 80 years of systematic data and 11 years from a perception threshold during that blank time. But we also added the information of regional skew and precipitation. So just going over that one more time, we have our best fit results that has uncertainty and our um, average, our mean curve. But to get into RFA, we all we can put in, like you saw in the workshop you just did, is the posterior mode LP3 curve and an effective record length where it then goes in and calculates what the uncertainty is. Okay, now for the now that the volume frequency analysis is done, we're moving on to RMC RFA and the reservoir frequency analysis. So let's look at the different um, analysis in RFA. We ran the flood seasonality to better understand when floods occur in our watershed. We can see that most of the floods occur in the winter and spring months, but um, flooding does continue as well during some of the summer months, just not that often. Then we ran the reservoir starting stage duration analysis to produce our stage duration curves for each month based on the period of record stage gauge. Then we ran the empirical frequency curve to get the plotting positions of the annual observed peak stages. We don't show that here, but you'll see them on the next slide. And then we entered the reservoir storage discharge tables that will control the operations for each of our um, inflow event simulations. Since this project is primarily driven by the capacity to release flow through the spillway, you see that the stage discharge curve rises very, very fast. We're not releasing much, and then it bends over because we've encountered the uncontrolled spillway, which has a lot of outflow capacity. All right, so this is a look, taking a look at our different stage frequency result sensitivities. So the flow frequency results were used as an input to RMC RFA software, which produces our reservoir stage frequency curves with uncertainty by utilizing the deterministic routing model while we treat the inflow volume, our inflow hydrograph shape, our seasonal occurrence of the flood event, and the antecedent reservoir stage as uncertain variables rather than fixed variables. Um, the two-loop nested Monte Carlo methodology that we've been talking about um, has natural variability simulated on the inner loop, which has many thousands of simulated flood events, and the knowledge uncertainty in the inflow volume frequency curve is simulated on the outer loop. Um, the LP3 statistics from each of the flow frequency analysis in the study were input separately, along with the effective rec record length to approximate the confidence um, that we calculated from best fit. In addition to creating stage frequency curves with full uncertainty, um, RMC RFA can also produce expected frequency only curves like we talked about. It has a much shorter computing time to efficiently compare sensitivities. So the mean stage frequency curves are all plotted together here on this slide. You can sh it just shows how adding temporal, spatial, rainfall runoff, and historic information reduced the annual exceedance probability of the stage frequency curve at elevations beyond the pool of record, specifically around the top of dam or the PMF elevation. So let's just walk through this individually here. So the green curve that's the most frequent, that's using just the post-dam period of record systematic data. 
And you see we move over to this yellow curve here where all we did was add the readily available USGS gauge data before the dam was built. And then we move over again when we added regional skew information. And then these two curves that plot together, um, one of them is adding the precipitation frequency curve information. That's the darker curve as, as quantile priors into best fit. And we also did an additional sensitivity where we didn't add the preset frequency, but we added the, the best we could, our estimate of historic, additional historic data based on that downstream gauge as a sensitivity. And you can see adding that historic data had about the same impact as adding the precipitation frequency data. Ultimately, we didn't have enough confidence in that historic data, so we just documented it as a sensitivity, but I left it in here to show how additional historic data can have significant effects. And in this case, about the same as adding the regional precipitation frequency information. So this is our final stage frequency curve that was used to inform project risk and it applied volume frequency results again that incorporated pre and post dam systematic data, informative prior distributions on the skew parameter from the regional analysis and prior distributions on quantiles or AEPs using our precipitation frequency and rainfall runoff modeling. So just to bring it all to a close and repeat a lot of the things I've said again, just for emphasis, this case study illustrated by example, how incorporating each piece of additional information reduces uncertainty and reduce the AEP estimates of the PMF, which were driving the project risk. Um, the original screening level analysis used limited systematic data and an outdated regional skew analysis, which resulted in unacceptable and actionable overtopping risk, which could have led to an expensive dam safety modification. Um, but by incorporating available information and using existing modeling, we reduced the estimated project risk to a tolerable level and eliminated the need to do a dam safety modification. Just our learning objective recap, we presented our flood hazard case study. We discussed the inputs, assumptions, and analysis and results. And again, we demonstrated how incorporating available information can reduce our uncertainty and potentially change our project risk estimates.